This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show in Florida, where authorities say hundreds may be dead after Hurricane Ian made landfall Wednesday along the state's southwestern coast as a powerful Category 4 storm, one of the strongest hurricanes ever to hit the area. Ian was about 500 miles wide when it crashed into Florida with a 30-foot-wide eye wall and hurricane-force winds that extended 40 miles from the center. Satellite images show the storm engulfing the entire state. High winds and storm surges devastated coastal communities. Some storm surges were 12 feet high. Some cities saw more than a foot of rainfall. More than two and a half million have lost power as we broadcast. Many are also without water. Rescue teams are working in the dangerous conditions to find people trapped in their homes. Earlier this morning, the sheriff of Lee County, Florida, Carmine Marceno, spoke by phone to ABC's Good Morning America. While I don't have confirmed numbers, I definitely know the fatalities are, are in the hundreds. Um, there are thousands of people that are waiting to be rescued uh, and, again, cannot give a true assessment until we're actually on scene assessing each scene and we can't access people. That's the problem. Fatalities in the hundreds? So far, confirmed in the hundreds, uh, meaning that we are responding to events, uh, drownings, uh, and again, unsure of the exact details because we are just starting to scratch the surface on this assessment. Uh, we, we're doing everything that we possibly can. Again, now it's to protect and preserve lives, uh, and we are in full force doing that. That's Lee County, Florida Sheriff Carmine Marceno being interviewed by George Stephanopoulos on ABC's Good Morning America. Hurricane Ian has now weakened to a tropical storm, dumping torrential rains as it heads toward Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina and South Carolina, after leaving a path of catastrophic damage. For more, we go to Tampa, Florida, for an update from Sean Kinnan, uh, News and Public Affairs Director at community radio station WN. Um, Sean, you are hunkered down there at WMNF. Your building is built to withstand a Category 5 storm. I have visited it repeatedly. It was in the track of Ian originally, but ultimately the storm hit south of you. You're staying there because you live on an island where you could not go back. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Give us the latest as you serve the community with information. Thank you, Amy. Yes, it, uh, in Tampa, I am in a building that can withstand a Category 5 hurricane, but lucky for the people of the Tampa Bay area, that's not what struck here. We were, we were spared. But uh, the most important story right now is what's happening down in southwest Florida, as you, as you heard from the sheriff of Lee County, where hundreds of people are confirmed dead from this storm with the unbelievable storm surge that came through uh, s several feet of water in, in major cities in southwest Florida, like Naples and Fort Myers. It's just been devastating, and we don't know the full extent of the damage yet, because it's just now daylight, and it's just now safe enough, perhaps, to go outside for people uh, and, and for these emergency crews to go out and assess the damages. Sean, could you uh, talk a little bit more about where these uh, fatalities, if there's been any talk of where uh, the most fatalities occurred, and also if there's any word on when uh, a power might be restored, two and a half million uh, uh, people now without uh, electricity? Yeah, so the, I don't know that much firsthand about the fatalities. All I know is what I'm hearing from the Lee County Sheriff. And just to give people a perspective of where that is, that's the largest city in Lee County is Fort Myers. And that's right where the storm came ashore. There's two barrier islands that it struck, Captiva and Sanibel on the way in, and also Cayo Costa. So it struck these barrier islands first and went ashore in Lee County. So there's, of course, going to be the most casualties there, perhaps. But there's been very strong rains and storm surges all along the coast, from Naples all the way up to almost to Sarasota. So perhaps there could be some there. I, I don't have any knowledge about that. But now we're also worried about river flooding inland. And, uh, you know, there's some of these rivers are going to be flooding for days and days from now because of how much rain has been accumulating upstream. 
want to bring in Dr. Harold Wanless. And, Sean, I'm going to ask you to stay with us. I hope you don't have to get off, since you're on the air constantly. But Dr. Harold Wanless is a professor of geography and urban sustainability. Um, hurricane Ian is the 121st hurricane to hit Florida since 1851, which has faced more hurricanes than any other state, millions of residents living along its coastlines. The storm first hit Cuba as a Category 1 storm, before it intensified to Category 4, near 5, when it made landfall in Florida. So we want to talk more about the rapid intensification of these storms and the sea level rise that's already occurred along Florida and how that's affecting the storm's impact. We go to Coral Cables, where we're joined by Dr. Harold Wanless, a professor in geography and urban sustainability at the University of Miami. He is on the board of directors of the CLIO Institute, a nonprofit dedicated to climate, educa uh, climate crisis education and advocacy. Um, <clears throat> so, you're in Coral Gables, Coral Gables. If you can talk about everything you're seeing in Florida now and where the climate or global heating plays such a key role. Well, thank you for having me, Amy. Yes, um, one of the things we've been seeing, and it certainly was true with Ian, is that when the wind shears down, the water is warm and it's the ocean water is getting much warmer because of climate change. We are seeing these, these storms that aren't otherwise stressed, just exploding in intensity. And uh, this was forecast by the hurricane folk, and it's exactly what's happening again and again. And we watched this one as it left Cuba just explode into this Category 4 storm. Um, and that is, is in large part because of a warming ocean and the Caribbean Sea and the southern um, Gulf of Mexico was extremely warm for this time of year, and, and that, that really drove it. Um, the, the other thing that we've seen with many storms, maybe only a little bit with this one, is that the steering currents tend to be weaker, so they tend to slow down and hang around where uh, uh, the one that hit Houston a few years ago was a good example of that. And, uh, and they end up just maybe not being a windstorm at the end, but dumping huge amounts of rain. And that sort of happened here. We slowed down as we moved on to Florida, and the rain around Orlando and south has been, been what will be catastrophic. One, one thing about this storm is we're, we, the, the places that were really hit were these very low barrier islands of Sanibel, and Captiva and Cuyacosta. These are extremely low and vulnerable. We haven't really heard much of anything from them yet. And they are it's they they got the main onshore surge. We saw pictures yesterday about from Naples with the water coming in uh, and and on Marco, which were well south of the main push. And we saw some of Fort Myers Beach, but those those outer barrier islands were just right in the path of the, the big eyewall onshore surge, and that's going to be be a huge problem uh, for those islands. It, it's it's going to be tragic when we see the evidence of what's happened there. And could you elaborate? I mean, even though Hurricane Eva, uh, Ian was downgraded to a tropical storm, what do you expect to unfold uh, uh, in the next few days in the worst hit areas in Florida? Well, and it's not just Florida anymore. There is a state of emergency on up the coast all the way to Virginia now. And uh, because it's, it's exiting um, Florida now, with 65 mile an hour wind still. So it's primed when it's at over the, the Gulf Stream, uh, which is again, warm water. It's primed to just reform as, a, as some level of hurricane. And then it will, uh, you know, it's just drawing in huge amounts of moisture. So, so um, uh, that, that's gonna be extreme. The, the problem with all the rain we've had in Florida, and I don't know the final numbers for the middle of the state, but um, we're, we're, we're only, most of the state is less than 100 feet in elevation. 
a little bit is higher around Orlando. And so there's really no big slope for the water to pour off of, which means you're not going to have these catastrophic floods coming out of intense floods out of rivers. But the water's going to stay flooding for days and days and days in, in many of these intense areas. Tens rainfall areas, so uh, that that's that's a second whammy, and it and it as this water is draining back into the Fort Myers uh, area from from the rivers there, it it uh, it's going to make it slower for even the storm surge to come back down. This was a fairly it, it had an angle where the storm was moving up the coast rather than straight into it. And um, that meant that the storm surge could move, push in for hours and hours. And we saw that yesterday. When Andrew hit um, Miami-Dade County in 92, the storm surge probably lasted about 10 or 15 minutes. It was a fast-moving storm moving straight in. Yeah. And uh, so it was in and out, and that's it. But this was, this was, this was a huge penetration of a storm surge. Dr. Ronless, at, at this time, when everyone's paying attention, you know, and you can only imagine what Pakistan is like when you have a third of the entire country underwater. This is a very close-up look at what that feels like um, here in the United States. But this time, when everyone's paying attention, it seems it's critical to talk about precisely what you're talking about, how global heating plays a role in this. And yet you have, like, the associate, the director of the National Weather Service saying on CNN, um, you know, you can never predict if a hurricane is a cause by climate change, any one particular hurricane. Well, that may be true. The bigger point he's making is, who knows if it's the climate crisis? You make a very different point, especially when you're talking about sea level rise well and and um, because of, of changing speed of the Gulf Stream uh, all around South Florida we're on the left side of the Gulf Stream and the Florida current we've had since 1930 about a foot of sea level rise so an equivalent storm 90 years ago would have been dealing with a land that was a foot more out of water so we're, we're it's not that that climate change may be something that will happen. We have warmed the ocean. That is putting more moisture into the atmosphere. We have expanded the ocean and uh, because of its warming, and that has raised sea level rise. We are melting ice from, from Greenland and Antarctica at an accelerating pace. That is, is going to, in the next few decades, make a quite dramatic influence on, on our present sea level rise. A dramatic change, and all these things are, are playing a role. The other thing, when you just want to talk about all the rain, whether it's a hurricane or, or just rainstorms or even snowstorms on land, as the atmosphere warms, it holds more moisture as as a water vapor, and as it moves on over the ocean, as it moves on land and and cools down, it it makes these heavier rains that we're seeing more and more of and even heavier snowfalls and during the winter. And so the, these, the, this increase in severe flooding is not just along the coast from hurricanes, but it's also from, from storms um, where, where the atmosphere has moved from the ocean, water laden onto to the land and, and is, is creating these, these intense precipitation events that are causing many of the floods we've seen in the last few years. These are increasing. All these are, are realities. Everything I've said is a reality of global warming because we have put more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We were just talking about the importance of methane, too, and uh, another powerful greenhouse gas. So, so these things are increasing. Everything from a warming atmosphere to a warming ocean to uh, uh, a melting of ice to increasing precipitation uh, over land. And, uh, and yeah. given that, uh, how much has uh, development uh, 
along these coastal areas changed to make uh, uh, buildings more secure and able to withstand uh, the effects of these uh, increasing number of extreme uh, weather events? And should there be well, so much development? Well, you could ask, should there be so many people, I guess, along with that. But, uh, uh, you know, there are four times the number of people when I was born in 1942 on Earth. That's, that's amazing. And we're, we're expanding out into places. Most of our new development on barrier islands is places that we felt were too low or too vulnerable or too narrow. And now if people want to live there, that's what's left. And there's so many examples where we, we you look at it and you say, that looks very risky, and, uh, but we're doing it. And, and we do it with houses, and then suddenly they turn into high-rise condominiums that are also extremely vulnerable. And as sea level rises and the shore wants to, to retreat landward, those are going to be left out in the ocean. And, and that will happen soon. Uh, you know, within the next few decades, we're really going to see that. Um, Warren Pilkey at Duke says for every foot of sea level rise on a coast like the Gulf or the Atlantic, we should have one to 2,000 feet of landward retreat of the coast as the ocean and the available beach sand re-equilibrate. And, you know, we've just had this rise of sea level, and, and it's, we're now trying to equilibrate, equilibrate with that. But we're having more rise in the future because of accelerating ice melt. So. Uh, Dr. Harold Wanless, I want to thank you for being with us, professor in geography and urban sustainability at the University of Miami. Uh, Sean Canan, this is what you do every day uh, at WMNF in Tampa, bringing out this kind of information. Your final comments as you live and broadcast from the station right now in the midst of the storm. Yeah, so Amy, what I would say to Dr. Wanless's point about the barrier islands and how dangerous it is for people to be building there and to be living there, just to give an example, the Sanibel Island Causeway, the Sanibel Causeway was completely wiped away in this storm. We've seen pictures of this bridge. That's the only road from the mainland to Sanibel Island and Captiva Island. It, it's been wiped away. So how do you get rescue supplies to these people? How do people evacuate if they didn't evacuate already? And, you know, this is just a, a very powerful storm, and we really don't know what to expect next as, as cleanup crews are, are just now going out to look at things. And to, to answer Nermeen's question from earlier, she was asking, when will power be restored to these people? We don't know, but we did hear from Duke Energy Florida, who said that they have to wait until the wind dies down to, in order to go out and restore the power to these people. That might be this afternoon in Pinellas County, which is in, near St. Petersburg, which is what sh they said. But who knows how long that is in Orlando or in Cocoa Beach or places where the wind is still howling.